Welcome back to my Analyze Prediction Series. Today I'm here with Cody at the Cincinnati Zoo. Hello. How's it going? It's going good. So, first of all, we'd like to say, if there's a lot of bird noise, we're sorry. We're in a birdhouse. It happens. We're not sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> we're sorry for them. I look a little bit. But it's cool to be surrounded by a bunch of birds, especially the really loud one over there. Oh, yeah, for sure. So, we're here to talk about the Guam Rail. Uh -huh. So, where can you find the Guam Rail? Guam Rail is found on the island of Guam and also Rota. Um, I think just off Guam as well. Uh, we're one of the handful of institutions that have them, and we've had brilliant success this past year. Which is the first time in, I want to say, 12 years. I had never seen them in my time here, so I was pretty excited for that. So we hatched out two chicks. Was it difficult to get the uh, rails in a position where they are comfortable to breed? Well, it's always a challenge breeding birds, getting them um, into an area where they do feel comfortable, getting them to an area where they feel safe, and you know, like. When you have people coming into a zoo and like looking at birds, it is kind of a challenge, but you want to make sure that they feel secluded enough. Um, this pair we just brought in the year before, so this was their first time in the exhibit, and they set up immediately. They found a great spot, kind of just out of guest view, and did all the work for us, so it made our job really easy. And you said like 12 years. Um, yeah. That's incredible. Right? Yeah. Yeah, especially an you know, institution like this and getting them to breed. Yeah. And as you said, like, different people. Can see them all the time. Mm -hmm. yeah, a lot of animals like sometimes are like not as comfortable with people like looking at them all the time. For sure, guam rails are very secretive. So um, when they are in the exhibit, it is really hard to find them. Like it's one of the things I like about this exhibit specifically is the longer you're in here, the more you're going to see. So if you just find a spot and you're quiet and uh, you just kind of hang out for quite a few minutes, you're going to see pretty much everything. But you know, once the birds kind of forget that you're here. Like when we first came in here earlier, um, we were looking for all the guam rails, and then we later learned that they weren't on exhibit. Yeah, they're so. not on exhibit right now, unfortunately. Uh, they will be back pretty soon. And then we'll get some footage of that uh, when they do come out. Fantastic. And what kind of environment do they uh, live in? I've never been to Guam, so. Yeah, I haven't either. Um, that's on my bucket list for sure. Um, but, you know, it is a kind of a tropical island, so you know, thick vegetation. Um, they're going to be you know, competing with a lot of various things, primarily the brown tree snake. That is one of their biggest issues. They have to deal with. That and also cats. Cat introduce cats to the island as well. Uh, but with the Guam rail and also the Micronesian kingfisher that we have here, that is native to that area as well. Um, those guys have a lot of challenges. It's a very interesting space. You know, it's just a smaller island, but you know a lot of really interesting things going on. And you mentioned the brown tree snake. Yeah. Um, is that not a native species? Of Definitely not. That was. Um, Guam was a staging area for one of our world wars. You know, I think it was World War II. Um, brown tree snake, when basically we'd move all of our cargo, we'd go from, you know, California to Australia to Guam, you know, kind of staging that Pacific theater. Um, when we stopped in Australia, a lot of the brown tree snakes ended up in our machinery and like, a lot of our heavy equipment. And then when we stopped off at Guam, um, all the snakes got off the, off the equipment. We are basically like, look at all the stuff here we can eat. No, yeah, nobody's going to eat us, so it was a really bad environment for the brown tree snake to thrive, but not good for other native species. And I was doing some research earlier, and like five species of birds have gone extinct in the wild. Yeah, the snake. yeah, and you know, it's crazy that the Guam rail is listed as extinct in their natural habitat. So we're really pumped that we can contribute to that population. Of, of right now, sir, Especially, like, even two chicks, it's a small start, but it's absolutely start. Absolutely, two chicks, and the overall population, the last time I checked, is around 234 birds total. So that's not a lot. That's not a lot. So anything we can do can definitely help them out. And is there a whole lot of like, research done on the Guam Rail to help you guys out? It's kind of figuring out as you go along. Um, there is a, a lot of research on various rail species. That's helped us out. Um, luckily for us, this was the proper environment that we didn't really have to do too much or actually research too much. I mean, rail diets are pretty pretty standard across the board. Uh, we know what they like to eat, we know what they thrive on. Uh, so we give them that proper diet and they have the space and they feel secure with it, so it just works out for us. And what like, would they eat in the water? So a uh, variety of things. Um, I mean, if you think of our diet here, uh, you've got a lot of different um, like cat food and dog food, which is a good source of protein for them. You also have pinkies, like some small baby mice. Um, they're going to eat lizards. They're going to eat just a wide variety of things. So they're kind of all over the place, which is which is pretty cool. And then, like besides the brown tree snake, like what would really prey on them? Um, apart from the brown tree snake, cats are the other really big issue. So really only introduced species. Introduced species, absolutely. Yeah. And it's kind of crazy that everybody had like no other predator and then 
uh, World War II comes along, yeah. is two like invasive species come in and yeah. wipe out five species. Yeah, it's, 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 it's pretty bizarre. Um, it's it's a sad story, but luckily we're kind of trying to reverse that trend. You know, we've uh, we've sent keepers in the past to the islands of Guam and Linda to help with the introductions, and we're always working very closely with all the other institutions that have them to make sure we can help that population. So you mentioned that you are also bringing uh, kingfishers from Guam as well. Absolutely. And how's that going? It's going really well. Um, we were actually breeding those guys so well that the SSP, the Species Survival Plan, and the, the stud manager actually asked us to kind of hold back a little bit. So we were doing really, really well. So it's kind of like, hey, we don't have enough places to hold them. So it's turned into like, all right, we're just going to hold for a little bit. And then once we can start moving birds around, uh, then we'll get back to breeding. But we've been very successful breeding Micronesian kingfishers. It's been it's been pretty cool to see, like you know, like raising them, like, watching the parents raise them. We, we intervene very minimally, so um, when we can, it's pretty cool. But uh, at, at the same time, like watching them do the entire job for us is really awesome. And what's been the hardest part of that process? Because you said they're kind of doing most themselves. Yeah. So with with the kingfishers, we try to stay as hands off as possible because there is a potential that they're going back to their natural habitat. So we want to make sure that we that don't imprint. Them. We don't imprint on them, or we don't, you know. Um, yeah, we just kind of stay very hands off with that, and uh, our parents, they, they're doing a really good job, so um, when they can do all the work for us, it makes our life easier, so we like that. And basically, it's just kind of monitoring, monitoring them, make sure they're doing okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah for sure. Just kind of leave them be. Yeah. Yeah. And since we're here in the birdhouse, we've yeah. got other birds around this room here. Yeah, there's a lot of really cool species in here. This is our Australasia exhibit. So it's kind of covering a, a general area, uh, but we've got you know hooded lapwings over here, or also there's masked lapwings. We have Ballymina in here, another species that's extinct in their natural habitat. We've been trying to get those guys to breed. Of course, we have the, the giant fruit bats hanging there, checking us out right now. Uh, we have, uh, wood swallows. There's a nicobar pigeon on the nest up here. Um, we have um, bulb. Uh, I'm sorry, no. yes, bulbuls. Uh, bulbuls in here. Also a blue crown laughing thrush. Pheasant pigeon, kind of running around the back area there. Uh, Shama thrush, it's one of the species in here. One of my absolute favorite bird species in here, uh, the Pied Imperial pigeon, uh, which is kind of behind the plants here, just under that valley in the um, One of my absolute favorite species, and it's really silly. Like when I tell other bird keepers, like this is one of my favorite species, they're like, why? And I'm like, I have no idea. I just think they're really cool. Well, thank you so much for talking about the Guam rail, no problem. Because Guam in general, and a bunch yeah. of all the birds in here. Uh -huh. And if you guys enjoyed this week's episode, don't forget to leave a big thumbs up down below, subscribe to my channel, and also check out my Instagram, at Cole Shirt. As always, I'll see you next week.